But fundamentally, I think it stands on its own as a way of working with chronic pain, especially chronic pain due to bracing and nervous system dysregulation and unresolved trauma and unresolved emotional states. So, um, so anyhow, I, I, I felt when, you know, when we came to uh, uh, marketing for, for people, I think I felt really comfortable that this was going to help and maybe not every person in the same degree. But again, you know, as I said, for, for if some exercises might be absolutely spot on for you, other exercises, maybe you want to do a, a go back to an earlier exercise and then go back to that exercise. So it's really very much, uh, you know, uh, user user friendly, uh, you know, and and uh, uh, user um, user and 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 also adding some things to follow your your uh, progress. So for example, a simple thing that we that I do is have people journal what they notice after sessions. And sometimes the person will say, well, the pain was worse. And then when we examine it, it wasn't that the pain was worse, but it felt more acute, but that only lasted for some hours or at most some days. And then that 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 shifted and then there was much less pain so you know again i think that it's something that anybody well i even if, even if you don't have chronic pain i think you could benefit from the the body as healer about embodiment and how as a culture as a society we are really disembodied you know from De descartes i think therefore i am which was rather wrong, it's, uh, it, uh, I think uh, Pascal said, the body has its reasons, which reason cannot reason. And so embodiment itself is something that is so deeply needed in this age in which we negate our bodily experiences. So even in that regard, I think it's valuable to have more, to cultivate greater vitality in our, in our bodies. So you know, it's not just for pain. It's not just for trauma. It's for all of the above. You know, Peter, I remember the conversation when you called me to tell me about this uh, series of exercises for chronic pain. And as you were trying, what happened inside my body is I had this rush of a uh -huh. yes with all these exclamation points. So that's why I interrupted you mid-sentence because I felt this big yes. Right. And okay. one of the things I remember uh, you saying to me, and I think it's so important is, you know, Tammy, we have to find a way to create a program that's designed that people will do the exercises again and again, because yes. it's in the repetition. If they'll do them, for somewhere yeah. between four and six months, then they'll get the results. But if they just do them one time, that's that won't generate the results in the same way. Yes, no. sometimes occasionally, no. but it's the yeah, repetition. Yeah. And so talk some about that. And is there some magic number, four to six months? And how often uh, do I have to do these exercises? Well, I would say do it a minimum of four months. Generally, people get significant and, and, and lasting results after six months. But any time afterwards, if the pain comes back or some haunting feelings and emotions or images come up, then go through some of the exercises again. Uh, and, and, and at any time, you know, just for getting more connection with our bodies, more, more vitality, uh, it's something you can do anytime. I mean, I, I as I recall, it's the, when the people sign up for the program, they can continue doing it as, as many times as they want, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, right. And so, good. And so I think, again, that, that doing it, it's not like it's a magical number, but it's, it's, it is a little bit of a, a magical number that it really seems to, to traction when you've done it for at least four months. And some people find that they actually needed to do it more than six months. But again, there's no shame in that at all. You know, it's really, really finding something that works from you and gives you lasting relief 
from pain and from the from the wounds of betrayal and trauma. Now I want to I want to bring Barbara into our conversation, but just right before I do, one one more moment here, Barbara. I know there are many people joining us who have experience with somatic experiencing. They may know the kinds of exercises you're referencing here. They may be like, oh, I know it's this, ex-. but there may be a lot of people, Peter, who are wondering, what's he talking about? What kinds of exercises am I going to do oh. over four to six months that are going to generate these tremendous results? I've already been to XYZ physical therapist doing this or that. What's sure. so special about these exercises? Maybe you could give us an example even of one, just so people can get a sense of what, right. what we're going to be doing in this four to six month period. Well, let's start with um, the fact that many people are uh, out of contact with their bodily sensations and feelings. And people, again, with trauma and, and chronic pain, even though they are riveted by the chronic pain sensations, but it's not really, it's not really the, the, the multitude of sensations that go on underneath the pain. And so I start with something that this is deceptively simple. And I call this the hand open, hand close exercise. And so and you can just join me here. As I say, this is just the very beginning of a whole series of, of I don't call them exercises, I call them awareness exercises or awareness sizes. Yeah. So just look at your hand and with curiosity, and just notice if it's more open or if it's more closed. So again, as you're looking at it, um, and if it's more open, just open it a little bit more, seeing it, viewing it, looking at it, and then let the hands close a little bit and look at the hands closing. And again, looking at them opening. Okay, that's looking at them. Now, the next step, is to actually put your mind in your hands, to put your, your mind into the physical sensation in your hands. So as you feel your hands opening, feel it physically. What does it feel like? You know, ask yourself that question. What does it feel like to open my hands? What does it feel like when I close my hands? Feel like mind into the, into the hands feeling it starting to open again, open again, and how does that feel physically? Now, closing the hand once more into a little bit of a light fist, and notice if you have any sense of power in your hands, in your hands as they're closed. Any sensations of strength, or of, uh, of power. Okay, and just noticing that. Now, again, slowly begin to open your hands again and open them and open them. And maybe notice if it feels like your hands are opening to receive something, something valuable, something that's your intention in doing this program to get relief from the pain. So just again, noticing how it feels for the hands to be open, to receive benefit, to receive healing, and to take that healing here that you feel in the openness in your hand, say into your chest, into your heart, and bring it into, and bring it into your heart. And just feel how that might feel to be able to give yourself that which what you need to heal, how the body will provide for you what's necessary for healing, hence the title, Body is Healer. So this is, again, a, a simple exercise, almost trivial exercise, except that when I, people do this, they give surprising results of saying something like, God, I could really feel my desire for healing. And it felt like it's something that I could wanted to bring into my chest and into my heart. I could also feel some power in my hands and my body and feel the power that I might have lost 
because of being abused, neglect, neglected, or traumatized. So again, we start with an exercise which is so, so simple. And again, often this is an exercise that people will do over again, over and over again. Another um, uh, exercise that I uh, suggest at the very beginning, because again, sometimes the feelings come, emotions come, and it's, they seem strong. And so to help so it doesn't become overwhelmed, I just have people just put their hands on the sides of their arms. And just again, in your imagination, notice if your hands here are helping you hug yourself, hold yourself, and holding the sensations and feelings that are going in your body so they're not overwhelmed, so that you're helping to contain them with your hands and maybe even gently, gently squeezing and releasing the muscles here with your hands and your shoulders. And again, just taking the time to notice how you experience that, how it feels to hug yourself. And some people might say, well, yeah, but you know, I never really got hugged as a child. And, you know, unfortunately, that's, that's often true, but it's still possible to feel what it feels like to be hugged, even though we may have only had limited uh, exposure to being hugged as, as a child, as, as children. So again, these kinds of exercises, as you continue with them, they will, my experience, they will generally, again, give more and more power to the program and your ability to work in the program. A lot of times people have thoughts like, oh, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work. I know it's not going to work. And so what I suggest is when you have the thought that this isn't going to work, to just preface it with the sentence, I have the thought that this program isn't going to work for me. So what's the difference? Because on, what happens is when we have thoughts, particularly negative thoughts, we confuse them for reality, but they're not reality. They're just thoughts. And they're thoughts that can move through like the other sensations in the body. And it's by, by just identifying it as a thought, we can begin to okay, let go of that. So again, you can just see, even with these three little baby exercises, we, you're already beginning to uh, enjoy the, I hope you're beginning to enjoy the possibilities of the program. It's amazing to me, Peter, how something as simple as what you've already introduced here, just these very introductory yeah. uh, awareness sizes uh, uh, create such such a change of state. It's amazing. Now, Barbara, I want to bring you into our conversation, and I wonder if you can share a little bit about how this work, uh, this aspect of somatic experiencing, really looking at freedom from chronic pain, how it has become important for you uh, personally and in your work as a practitioner. Yes. So, um, I have a background as a nurse. I was an intensive care nurse before I became a psychotherapist and then um, a somatic experiencing practitioner. And so I really was in the throes of complex physical health conditions and people who were in a lot of pain. And that that pulled at my heartstrings. I also have people in my family who have had you know, a variety of different chronic pain and chronic stress conditions, including myself. Um, and when I went through the program, the somatic experiencing program, I learned that I really had a, a favorite saying of Peter's. There are many, but one of my favorites is without tools, trauma rules. And so that kind of refers to some of these practices and exercises that are in this program. And I also have chronic pain. I have Ehlers-Danlos and so now that's turned into um arthritis in many of my joints. And so I was doing the practices and I, through doing that, I learned that I was feeling very different in my body. And so 
And, and then also in doing the work with others, we were finding the same thing that these practices can really support um, ways of working with chronic conditions, whether that's chronic fatigue or chronic pain or chronic stress. And now in the medical world, there's um, it's lovely because there's more of a coinciding of understanding of pain. It used to be that we considered pain as something that came from basically damage to the tissues and the bodies. And that was really called um, nociceptive pain. And now there's four different kinds of pain. And we definitely know that pain now is anything that activates the pain circuitry in the brain, which can be anything from actual damage to the tissues or anything from chronic stress, chronic overwhelm and, and trauma and even grief. So um, there's a much broader understanding of it now in the medical community, which is really important, I think, because anything that has to do with contraction, constriction, bracing, and numbing are the things that really impact our bodies at the tissue level. And so those are the things that are going to show up and get in the way of our sleeping, and they're going to get in the way of our feeling good and feeling connected with ourselves. So these practices and many of the teaching, all the teachings that Peter brings is about getting to know the subtleties in our bodies so that we can really start to understand the state differences between nervous system activation and non-nervous system activation. And what are the tissues and where are the places in our bodies that feel less constricted, contracted, braced, or numbed? And so when we start working with those places, and sometimes it's global, the shift can happen. And so I've just been really, I have a lot of different tools in my tool belt of trainings. I'm kind of a little bit of a training junkie in some ways, but somatic experiencing is tried and true, and it really can be applied. I, I run everything that I do through the lens of somatic experiencing um, and these practices because it yields results and people can find their way back home to themselves. And that's what I really want to share with folks is that there are ways that you can come home to yourself and be connected and partnered with yourself. And that's the, that's the goal. Good, good. I want to re-emphasize home, coming home to the body, coming home to the self, to the true self, mm -hmm. to the self that was there before any pain or trauma, which is really the part of ourselves that is enduring and deeply precious and yeah. deeply, deeply precious. Yeah. I was going to say something else, but somehow it slipped away. But, but I you, have a, a follow-up question uh, for Barbara, which is you talked about your own journey a, a little bit with pain and using these exercises. Did you find awareness sizes? Did you find that they completely gave you freedom from pain, gave you a different way to relate with pain and reduce the pain? What were the actual results that you've experienced in, in your life? And then I'd also love to know more about, as you've worked with other people, what kinds of results you've seen, both. I think that's a good question. And it comes with, you know, kind of um, some nuances to it. So yes, I have alleviation of pain. And I can still go into places of holding and constricting where I get back into that. But what I really find that is I, it's really this partnership with myself that's quite different. And I love what Peter said at the end of this preciousness, you know, and so that I regard myself very differently and my self-care practices have really changed. And as a result of that, through these practices, I have more flow is what I would say through my body. And so I have more access to my authentic self and movement. And so I literally move through the, through the world differently. I used to work uh, a walk actually about, when was it like six years ago? I used to walk with a fairly significant limp. Actually it was in 2014 when I had surgery in my ankle, I walked with a significant limp before that. And, uh, and sorry, after that surgery, and I don't have a limp now and I don't, I don't feel constricted in my movement. Um, and so that, that it, it's like this cascade effect. So if I'm feeling a little bit better, then I move sort of more fluidly. And then that fluid movement helps me feel better. And it's this other cycle, which is lovely instead of a pain cycle that just begets more pain. So we can have flow and more freedom in our bodies that can get beget more, more flow and 
and freedom in our bodies. And it's, it, it, it takes some work. It takes practice. It takes time. Mm -hmm. And to really say like, we have to kind of attend to these and it's, you know, in my, my experience, what I share with my clients is that there's a lot of grit to this. There's grit and there's grind and we have to kind of get through that and support each other in the frustrating moments of like, it just feels like I have pain everywhere and it's not working. And then to kind of be with ourselves or be with another who can say, you know, you know, maybe we can find a place that doesn't hurt quite so much as every place else. Or maybe there's something out in the outer world that we're looking at that might bring a little bit of relief. And so we can have practices with our friendship groups and our families that support this other way of relating to ourselves and others through this other paradigm. And those all come from their practices. But my, I have found um, in my own work as a in my own personal work and as a professional, that there's sort of an inherent desire in the body um, and the tissues of the body um, to, to want to live in a less expensive state. It's very costly to be activated all the time, whether we're in nervous system activation of fight, flight, or freeze. Those are very costly states and they can literally shorten our lifespan and our tissues really don't want to be in that place. They, we just need to re-familiarize our tissues with a less expensive state of survive from survival physiology back to something that's sustainable, sustainable physiology. Then our tissues, our whole organism can recognize, oh, that's the state, that's the place to be in. And we start gravitating to it more and more. I work with horses and part of the thing, one of the many things I've learned from them is that they, they orient, many mammals orient to things that are pleasant or pleasing rather than to the things that are noxious and overwhelming. Um, certainly we have the capacity to attend to the things that are noxious and overwhelming, but then most mammals, except for humans, seem to, you know, kind of come out of that. They complete that part of the process and then they come back home to their natural state of sustainable physiology. And that's inherent in our mammalian wiring. We can get back to that. It takes time and it takes grit. We can get back to that. Yeah. Yeah. And persistence and courage yeah. and courage. You said something which I really like. You talked about having a partnership with our bodies. And I think that's really, in a way, the essence of this program is to develop a partnership, a friendship and a partnership with our bodies. Yeah. So and, thank you for that thought. Yeah, and I think it's in, as, as you said, Peter, it's uh, encoded in the title, Body is Healer. And as I was thinking about this conversation on chronic pain, I thought, God, you know, when you're in pain all the time, it's like body as problem not mm -hmm. body as healer. It's like yeah, body yeah, as yeah. my enemy. You know, you're my enemy. You're not my partner, my home, my healer. What a change in uh, orientation that is. Now, Barbara, you mentioned a couple of times uh, how our, our tissues uh, are reacting to our nervous system state. And I, I realized I don't understand exactly the relationship between what's happening in our tissues and what's happening in our nervous system. And I wonder if you two could make that more explicit, specifically in resolving chronic pain. I think the basic way, you know, a basic example is, you know, if I, if my nervous system, if I get activated, let's say I'm looking around and I, I see something that feels like a potential or perceived threat, my, my nervous system, my body is going to go into a threat response cycle and that's inherent in all mammals. And so I'm going to go through this process of assessing the danger. I'm going to, you know, I mean, these are all instantaneous. I might I might startle, I might freeze, I might take action, I might run, and I might, um, and I might um, take action in terms of fighting. Um, if any one of those actions in the threat response cycle is thwarted for whatever reason, my nervous system is still in the mode of that. So what I need to do is find some way to complete that. So for example, let's say I'm camping outside and, um, and I'm one of the mountains here is Mount Lemon. Let's say I'm camping up at Mount Lemon and I see a bear and I and I run from the bear. In my world, I'm going to run from the bear. And I run from the bear. Let's say I get into my car and I lock the doors and I drive back home to Tucson. And my nervous system, by the time I get home to Tucson, is still going to be assessing 
where's the bear? Where's the bear? Where's the bear? Where's the bear? And I'm going to be more likely to understand what's in my world around me, perceiving it as a threat than a safety. So let's say I've had that experience on Mount Lem and I come back down and I see a garden hose. I'm going to think snake rather than garden hose because my body is primed for that with the chemicals that are in my bloodstream priming for assumption of threat because that's safer for me essentially. But if I'm Protective. same scenario, if I'm up at Mount Lemon and I, I see a bear and I run from the bear and I get to my car and I lock the door and, and I sit for a moment, I go, oh, I'm not in threat anymore. Or there's no bear. I outran the bear. Okay. If I take a moment to just acknowledge like this shift has happened and there's relative safety in this moment, then my nervous system can take a shift chemically and says, ah, okay. And this is all really specific to parts of the body that's in the brain and in our actual nervous system physiology my chemistry in my body is going to start to, to, to have less adrenaline, less epinephrine in it. And then when I drive down to Tucson, I'm more likely, more likely to be able to have an accurate response to the moment that I'm in. If I happen to see a hose, I'm going to be more likely to acknowledge it as a hose than a snake. That's the short version of it in my world anyway. <laughs> well, the nervous system is also tissue. Absolutely, it's a specialized form, a form of tissue. But I think in the, in the I'm of 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 full disclosure, we should mention that it's usually not the best thing to run away from a bear. Right. Thank you, Peter, for bringing that up. You're it's you're always, always here to help. I yes, appreciate that. Thank you. I but usually have that caveat with that right, story. Right. Right. Yeah. To slowly back away, and if it looks like the bear is coming towards you to lay down on the ground, that's easier said than done, and just wait there. Uh, it's pretty well known that most of the time, bears are, really aren't interested in, in us and eating us, uh, but we don't want to challenge them by running and then um, <laughs> wind up um, having them um, chase us down. Right. Very good. Um, um, thank you, Peter, for that. It's good. Thank you. I, we are going to open up now uh, the All chat right. for people who uh, may want to write their questions as you've been listening, and I'll incorporate as many as we can into this last uh, portion of our discussion. I did have a question, Peter. You mentioned before how suppressed emotions yeah. might relate to chronic pain, and I was wondering if you could help me understand something like suppressed anger, let's just take as an example, and how that could flower as pain in my life, how that might yeah. work. Well, okay, let's look at anger, anger, rage. Um, those are strong emotions, and they're also motions in the body. And what we do is we brace against those emotions and that causes a, bot a further bottling up of the emotion. And remember, anger is related to the fight response, to kill or be killed. That's life threat. And so that is absolutely going to uh, wreak havoc on our bodies uh, until we're able to deal with the emotion. But one way to not deal with the emotion is to mindlessly um, yell the emotions out, just charge the emotions in, in that way. But really to feel the emotions, to feel them as physical sensation in the body. And of course, a number of the exercises do just that. To feel the emotions in the body and then just to notice as you follow those emotions, what's the energy that's within that emotion. What's the energy and what might be also protecting ourselves from something, from someone? And, and then how is that that we keep repeating that even though that person is no longer a threat to us or is no longer hurting us as they did when we were, we were children? So it really has to do, I remember, the, that exercise that I showed you at the, uh, a while ago 
of the self-hug exercise, that's also useful in working with strong emotions. Because again, the idea is it helps you contain those emotional feelings so that they, they're they not going out helter-skelter. And I think that's the point. And then to, again, look beneath the emotions and see, okay, well, what am I so angry about? What am I so frightened about? What, what am I, what grief am I avoiding of somebody that I was very close to that, that died or that left us? And so we look at some of the ins and outs, the nuances of the emotions. So, very good. Very good. Yeah, it's yeah. helpful. Now we received a couple of questions. And I think this is a, a good uh, piece to pull out about bracing. What exactly is bracing? Uh, what causes it and how do I release it? Okay. Okay. So let's just say somebody was hitting me as a child. And so my shoulders went up to protect themselves, protect me, protect myself. So what I'll often have to do, and often there's then pain in the in that area from the chronic holding of the tension. So what I have the person do in in some of the exercises, awareness exercises, is just to notice what happens if that tension, what the tension is beneath the pain. And what the tension might want to do if the tension increased. So most people will say, well, my shoulders go up like that even more. So I say, okay, but now just do it a little bit. Just a smallest, smallest amount and then release them. Notice sensations, feelings, images, thoughts. And again, just slowly increasing the tension. Now, the pain may increase while you're doing that, but then as you release the tension, very often the pain will also release and, and, and let go. So that's the example of bracing causing pain and working with the tension under, that's causing the bracing and then seeing what happens when that can go through and it's no longer, uh, no longer uh, taking the form of, of pain. So we find the bracing, we find the tension, we find the movement within the tension. We allow the movement to occur just the smallest amount. That's one of the keys in somatic experiencing called titration. You don't go blasting right into these difficult emotions or sensations or feelings. You just touch into them. So let the shoulders just touch in a teeny bit and then release. And then pause. Notice sensations, feelings, images, memories, thoughts, whatever. Whatever now, comes into your stream of, of awareness. Peter, Peter, you mentioned uh, that in many ways uh, this program could be good for anyone, uh, and yet it has specific applications for people who have chronic pain that they don't know the physical root, but we have yeah. lots of questions that people are asking, like, is this for me? Uh, what about uh, an autoimmune illness no. like lupus? My husband yeah. has scoliosis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, migraines. What would you say, like, the program really is designed to address people suffering with these conditions? I would say yes. But it's it's definitely more complex, more complicated. Autoimmune conditions are more complicated than simple chronic pain. But they're also amenable to doing this kind of uh, work. Um, uh, 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 Barbara was talking about her, uh, you know, her uh, uh, RA, her rheumatoid. I guess it was rheumatoid. Ellers, Ellers. Oh, it was down. But, and, but that's, again, something that seems like it does have a, a genetic component, but it's also a functional component. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's not that this is going to be the cure-all for everything that ails the person. But when you're able to regulate the nervous system, then generally you will, or at least frequently, you will get results with things like lupus, autoimmune conditions. 
when I uh, when I work with people with autoimmune conditions like lupus, fairly typical. When I did, I I, I don't I don't I no longer have a, 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 pra a practice a therapy practice, but I often will work with uh, somebody who is uh, like work with Chinese medicine and 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 acupuncture and and homeopathy as supportive. Uh, and there are times when you may need to have medical intervention, like the use of, of steroids and so forth, just to blunt the response. And so I always suggest when you're working with somebody with those kind of conditions, try to work with a, with a, uh, with a physician who is knowledgeable and who you have a working relationship as a therapist with um, with with uh, those uh, physicians who work with like immunologists and so forth. Um, so working together with these complicated uh, uh, syndromes is something that we need to get extra support. And often that's the case of somebody who's practicing complementary medicine, but also somebody who's practicing um, regular medicine. You know, I was just thinking this kind of remind me of something else. Yesterday, I was at this hospital, and they asked me to, uh, to do a, a, a class for uh, a number of young doctors who were just doing their rotations and so forth. And I asked them, I said, show of hands, how many of your patients have chronic pain conditions? Like nine out of 10 hands raised. And what do you do? Well, you know, we tr try not to use opioids. We try to use some, you know, other milder forms. Uh, well, would you be willing to do a little exercise with me? And I did this bracing so exercise with them. And they were like blown away, like, my God, I can do this with some of my patients. I'm going to do this with some of my patients. So again, sometimes we're getting benefit from from medical doctors, but they're also getting um, uh, benefit from us, from what we're doing. So I think a partnership is also very valuable, very valuable. Definitely. I wanted to jump in and add just a little thing about the bracing too, is that um, I love all of the, we, with the, some of the questions that are coming in, this might attend to that as well. So my kind of my earlier process really was working with um, complex and developmental trauma. And so I worked with young children. Um, and so what I was really noticing in the young children is that, you know, we have this capacity in our bodies to have this moving towards and away. And that's before we have language. We have that inherently in our bodies. It's also kind of an approach and avoid type of thing. And so we have to, when we're younger and dependent as little ones, we have to prioritize the moving towards because we're dependent and we know kind of inherently that we need another or others to help us in a given moment. And so what happens in our bodies though, if, I, if we're young children and we are moving, we know that we need some help um, and we need some support and we move towards but maybe the person or the environment that we're quote unquote moving towards doesn't feel quite right, might be giving some signals of threat or, or danger. We actually have to override that because then we, we, so we override the away and we prioritize the toward. And those behavior, those, those actions, they're not really behaviors, but those actions in our bodies, what we do with that, like Peter was saying, like if my, if my shoulders are gonna be tense and up by my ears as a result of kind of being around people as an automatic response, these automatic responses then are in the category of constricting, of being of constriction, bracing, contracting and freeze. And, and immobility. And so we, in the process of going through a program like this and, and working with a somatic experiencing practitioner, we can get at those holding patterns that are in our bodies that are below the level of our conscious mind. So they're part of our implicit memory. And a lot of when we have what I call thwarted away, that thwarted away, those constrictions and contractions end up in the system of like our digestive system and our softer tissues of our digestive system and our immune system and our endocrine system. And so what those other systems end up holding this burden that they're not meant to carry. And so when we 
we start to unpack that and and have the different partnership with ourselves, then the 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 burden then gets distributed differently, and it feels tr- very different in the body. We've received many questions about the actual design of the Body as Healer program. People wanting to know, is it different than the Healing Trauma book CD that I got with Peter so uh-huh. many years ago? Right. Uh, it yes. is, in fact, uh, uh, very, very different. And people are wondering how much live participation there'll be. So just to share, this is now the second time we've run the program. The first time we ran the program, Peter did six Q&A sessions, live sessions, and those are all recorded and included in this second round of the program. And in this second round, there'll be four live sessions. Peter will be participating in two of them with Barbara, and then Barbara will be hosting uh, two of the sessions, Q&A sessions on her own. There are all of the exercises, the follow-up practices, the video teachings that contextualize all of the material, along with the work from Bella Ruth Knapperstack, which takes you into healing the shame of trauma uh, and releasing trauma through guided imagery. Peter, anything else, Barbara, you'd like to say about the design of the program and how we've really tried to create it with the effective results in mind? It took a lot of research, you could say, and a lot of um, experimenting to really find the right combination and the right sequences. Uh, and uh, so it was it was really carefully thought out. Um, same is true with Belarus part. Um, it was a, a person asked, if, uh, I think there were two people asking a similar question, by the way, P- with people who have vertigo or dizziness, uh, sometimes it's diagnosed as POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So if you person stands up, they get very dizzy, their blood pressure drops and because the nervous system is unable to support it. And then, uh, and then their heart beats to tr- fast to try to make up for that difference. And that is one of the things that you often see with chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome. Uh, I've seen that with a number of people I've been had been working with who have long ha- have long COVID, and it seems to benefit uh, those kinds of symptoms as well. But again, it's not a cure all for everything. But I really encourage anyone to give it a try and to see what benefits you can get. I like the way the program was geared toward, um, you know, different learning styles as well. So Mm -hmm. you can watch videos. There's a workbook to work through. You can listen to the pre-recorded or not to the pre-recorded, but the the Q and A's that Peter and I also did some last year too, that I think are also part of the recording um, that people can get access to. And, um, and then there's the practices that you can do experientially. And then there's also a, a portion where, I um, talk people through the the exercises so you hear my voice going through it. So there's it's different ways of of getting mm-hmm. to different learning styles, um, and it's a way to keep it kind of all in all in one where you can kind of go back and there's an arc of trajectory through the whole thing as well, um, and that that everybody then has access to it. So I think those are the highlights for me of what I like about this program very much. Good, 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 good. good. I want to thank our friends who are here with us. Uh, My apologies that we weren't able to get to all of the questions in the chat, nor the hand raisers. I do encourage you, if you're interested, we run the program like this with the live sessions just once a year. And so our program is starting now on October 12th. That's when enrollment ends. And I'd encourage you to come to soundstrue.com and learn more. And uh, I hope, you know, really the, the dream here, Peter, when you called me, I remember exactly where I was in my house on the couch and uh, I was sitting there and I, you know, I, I jumped up and there was a sense of all the people who would benefit the mm-hmm. ripple effect that yeah. this would have for decades to come. And yeah. I think that's really uh, the case. And so it's Thank with you. a big 
uh, open embrace that I invite you all to join us. And thank you, Barbara. And thank, thank you, you, Peter, always for your Barbara. generosity. You know, every time yeah. you show up, you show up to help. It's such a great quality. You'd go on and answer these questions for hours. It's just your spirit. So. Hey, speaking of that, um, maybe uh, Tammy, you and I and Barbara could be just on for a couple of minutes after people sign off. Yeah, we'll send, actually our team will send you both a new uh, link for that and we can chat for a moment. Okay, thanks friends. We'll send the chat now, now, the link now. We'll send you an email. We'll send you an email right after this. Oh, okay, okay, great. Thank you friends. Yep.